Happy New Year, everybody. It has already been stupidly eventful in more ways than one, but let us push that to the side and talk about the films because we have got some great films to talk about. Way better than most years. Actually, technically speaking, twice as good as most years because a lot of the films from 2020 have moved over here. So that's the first thing I have to say is, if there is a film, whether it be Dune or No Time to Die or The Eternals or The King's Man or Last Night in Soho, French Dispatch, whatever, Nightmare Alley, if there was a film that was on my list last year and has been moved to this year, it will not be ranked on this list. So if you don't see a film that you believe should be on the list, chances are it was on last year's list and has been moved to this one and I'm just not ranking it as to give other films a chance. Second thing is uh, the Snyder Cut uh, will not count and will not rank, in my opinion, as a film because technically it is a four-part miniseries, but if it had been ranked, it would have been in the top five, if not higher, because I'm really looking forward to that. And the last thing before we begin is that there are two films that I'm really excited for, but I'm not actually sure are gonna come out in 2021. Uh, they're filming in 2021, I believe, hence why I'm unsure. The first one being Brad Pitt and David Leitch's Bullet Train, and the second one being The Grey Man, which is the Russo Brothers uh, film with Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans and Anna de Armas, and that just looks so good. Uh, but I'm not going to count it purely because I'm not sure of its release date. Now, on to the honorable mentions. We have Uncharted, The Matrix 4, The Last Duel, Old, The Green Knight, and Next Goal Wind, which would have been um, number 11. That's the Taika Waititi, Michael Fassbender football film, which I'm really excited for. Anyway, moving on to the top 10, which starts off with Shang-Chi, Legend of the Ten Rings. Now, this year, I think we can all agree, is gonna be a terrific year for the MCU. Uh, a very crowded and a very exciting year for the MCU. And I think with Shang-Chi and Eternals, we're gonna get a different side to the MCU, one that we haven't seen before, and it's gonna be a really refreshing change of pace. And the reason I'm so excited for this film primarily is because it's been so long since we've had a really, really good mainstream martial arts film. Uh, you know, aside from the Raid films, aside from the Ip Man films, you know, something properly mainstream. And I really want Kevin Feige and the team to be able to revitalize the martial arts genre and bring it to kind of Western audiences and have it be universal because it's such a fun and exciting and diverse genre. And for me, the thing that gets me most excited is that uh, you've got Tony Leung and you've got Michelle Yeoh on the film. And they are some of my favorite actors of all time, actors who have basically defined the martial arts genre as we know it, whether it be with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon or Hero. And so I'm just excited to see them hop on into the MCU. At number nine, we have Don't Worry Darling. This is Olivia Wilde's second film, obviously her first one being Booksmart, which was terrific, but this one, excites me so much because it is so much more complex and so much more intriguing and, and it has so many more sort of working parts to it, you know? And the cast, for one, is just insane. You have Olivia Wilde acting in the film herself. You've got Harry Styles, you've got Florence Pugh, Chris Pine, Gemma Chan, some of the most exciting actors working today. And what's even better is the setting that all of these actors are in and what they're gonna be doing because the film essentially is supposed to be a psychological horror thriller um, set in the 50s. And from what I've seen in the set photos and stuff like that, it just looks beautiful. And you've got Matthew Liberty on cinematography. I mean, this is gonna be such a visually interesting and stylish and, and sort of sexy film and, and one that I think is gonna get a lot of people's attention when it eventually comes out. Also, I have to say that out of all of the films on this list, it has the coolest title. Don't Worry Darling, for some reason, I think it's just such an, like it just rolls off the tongue for me and I just find it so cool. Anyway, on to number eight, which is Don't Look Up. Uh, this is Adam McKay's next film and it it's the one that basically broke the internet because it had literally every actor on the surface of the sun. Um, this is a very exciting film for me because of the cast primarily. I've been public uh, on the channel before about how I'm not the biggest fan of Adam McKay, whether it be his comedies or his more serious dramas like The Big Short and Vice, purely because I just don't really get the hype personally. Um, and I don't love his sort of directing style. I think he did step it up with Vice, but I've just, it, I've never really been able to connect and vibe with, with his particular approach to filmmaking and storytelling. That said, you know, the, the people around him, whether it be the cinematographers, and I believe it's Robert Richardson or Linus Sangren, I'm not sure, and of course the cast, 
it, it, it's they're making it bloody hard to not make this film good. Um, and, you know, when you have a cast like that, clearly there's something special going on. And clearly, you know, all of these people are coming together to tell something that's important and fun and entertaining. And so I have faith that it's going to be great. And I hope that Adam McKay proves me wrong and completely knocks my socks off with this one. On to number seven, which is The Northman. This is uh, Robert Eggers' next film. He's already surprised us, you know, with The Witch and then obviously blew us all away uh, with The Lighthouse. And now he's got this all-star cast, you know, you've got multiple scars guards, Nicole Kidman, Ethan Hawke, Anya Taylor-Joy, who in my opinion is one of the, the most exciting up-and-coming actresses working today. And it's supposed to be like a Viking revenge tale, all right? And knowing Robert Eggers, I'm, I'm expecting this to be something along the lines of like uh, Valhalla Rising, you know, the Mads Mikkelsen, Nicholas Winding Refn film, you know, visually just stunning, atmospheric, stylish, brutal in every way. And just to have that Robert Eggers flair that we've come to know and love, you know, that sort of old school style of filmmaking that very few directors are able to pull off nowadays. And so that's why I'm super excited for The Northman. At number six is Mission Impossible 7, which I'm immensely excited for purely because the Mission Impossible franchise has been on such a roll, especially with Christopher McQuarrie, who shows no signs of stopping. And of course, you have the man himself, Tom Cruise, who is putting himself on the line once again but in this case, uh, both physically in terms of the stunts, but also as a producer with all of the stuff that he's had to deal with. And for anyone wondering uh, what my thoughts are on the whole like leaked tape situation, I'm, I don't mind. I'm perfectly on board with that. I think it's, it's, it, it was the right thing to do. And, um, you know, even if, uh, he, you know, he kind of blew his top off a little bit, that's what happens. That's filmmaking. And I do believe that this film is meant to inform a lot of what happens in Mission Impossible 8. And so it'll be very exciting to sort of see this sort of Infinity War Endgame style structure where you have a lot of the stuff happening and then concluding in that final film. So I'm very excited to see how that plays out, what happens, and, and all of the great, great action sequences that we get. At number five, we have Soggy Bottom, or at least that's the rumored title anyway. This is Paul Thomas Anderson's next film after the masterpiece that was Phantom Thread, in my opinion. And I'm so excited to see Paul Thomas Anderson, who I think we can all agree is one of the best directors working today, you know, go and tap into that time period. Uh, with such a great cast too, with Bradley Cooper at the helm, and I, I believe Sean Penn too, and one of the Safdie brothers, and Philip Seymour Hoffman's son. And I feel like this is going to be such a unique and exciting experience for a lot of us uh, fans of uh, PTA, and especially going into award season um, this time next year or whatever. It's going to be so crowded, and we're going to have so many great directors sort of, you know, coming against each other, and it's going to be incredibly, incredibly exciting to see Paul Thomas Anderson in the mix and what he brings. At number four, we have the Gucci film. This is directed by Ridley Scott, and it has an all-star cast. I believe it has Lady Gaga, uh, Adam Driver, Jared Leto. Uh, it was meant to have Robert De Niro, but I do believe he may have been replaced by Jeremy Irons, and it also has Al Pacino. And the reason I'm almost like inappropriately excited uh, for this film is because I was such a big fan. I was in the minority, but I was such a big fan of All the Money in the World. You know, that was a film that kind of just came and went, especially after that whole Kevin Spacey controversy. It just kind of came and went and not a lot of people actually talked about the actual film. I loved it. I think it is such a terrific film. One of Ridley Scott's best films recently. And I do feel like Ridley Scott will be tapping into, you know, a similar sensibility with this Gucci film. And it just sounds, you know, the premise and of course the cast, so exciting. But also I feel like Ridley Scott, you know, say what you will about him, but as a director and as a producer, this is someone who is basically able to make a $50 million film look like a $250 million film. He is just such a proficient director in that regard. And so when it comes to depicting the Gucci family in such a legendary and historical story, I think he's really gonna be able to take it through the roof and give us something truly, truly special. At number three, we have Spider-Man 3, which is my most anticipated superhero film of this year, along with most people, I believe, for two primary reasons by the name of Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. Oh my God, let's go. This is basically going to be the Spider-Verse, the live-action Spider-Verse that a lot of us have been waiting for. And of course, if we're going to get Jamie Foxx and Alfred Molina and Kirsten Dunst and J.K. Simmons and Emma Stone, wow, you know, it's going to be such a, 
such an experience and I will say though, the, my one concern is that because you have so much stuff going on and they're probably gonna end up introducing Miles Morales or something, you know, is it gonna be too crowded? Is it gonna be too messy? Uh, especially when you have someone like John Watts directing and I think a lot of us are sort of familiar and, and can agree on the fact that John Watts is not the greatest MCU director, he's not the greatest director on the surface of the sun. I've been very vocal about the fact that my issues with the Tom Holland Spider-Man films are that they just kind of lack personality and flair, especially Far From Home, which felt very bland with the exception of the Mysterio scenes. And I'm really hoping that John Watts is able to kind of step up his game and do something special with this one because he's basically been given everything you could possibly need to make a masterpiece superhero film, you know? And if all of these different factors are able to gel together in a, you know, in a brilliant way and somehow they bring in Jake Gyllenhaal back and they bring in Michael Keaton and even Tom Hardy or Woody Harrelson or Jared Leto as Morbius and they have all of these things, you know, it's gonna be really difficult to juggle. But if they're able to pull it off, I think we have the potential of this being one of the greatest superhero films ever made and a film that in many ways could top or rival Endgame, you know, in, in the, in, on the scale level. And so that's why I'm really excited to see this film. And I hope, and I hope that they pull it off. At number two, we have Killers of the Flower Moon, which is the next Martin Scorsese film. For the first time, him and DiCaprio and De Niro are working together on a feature film. For those of you who don't know, they have worked together before on this short like casino commercial for like a Macau casino. But this is the first time they've done a feature film together, all three of them. And, and it's a legendary thing. You know, it's a historical moment to have these three come together and do a film. And also I think that this is gonna be Scorsese's sort of first proper, proper big epic since Gangs of New York, maybe. You know, it's been a while since he's done such an epic film on this scale. The budget, I believe, is like $220 million or something, I'm not sure. But it is meant to be one of his biggest films, his most expensive film ever. Uh, I do believe it's meant to be a Western, actually, and to see Martin Scorsese make his first Western is so exciting. And I, and I know that he's incredibly excited because he's spoken about that. And, and to, for him to do it with DiCaprio and De Niro, that for me, as a film fan, you know, I can die with my eyes closed now. That is gonna be a truly, truly legendary experience and one I think that will just blow everyone away. Now, uh, my number one film, and if you've been a long time follower of this channel, you definitely know, you've probably called it from the very beginning, is of course Babylon. Babylon is Damien Chazelle's next film, um, and this stars Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie. Um, unfortunately, she's had to replace Emma Stone, who I believe is pregnant, uh, so she couldn't do the film, but this is uh, a film about films, uh, a film about the transition from the silent era of Hollywood to talkies. Yes, I know the artist already kind of did that, but this is Damien Chazelle, people, okay? We're not messing about here. Damien Chazelle, uh, for those of you who don't know, is probably my favorite director and the director that kind of pushed me into filmmaking. Whiplash and La La Land are the two kind of most important films to me in, in more ways than one, and he has taught me so much about filmmaking, and he has really allowed me to fall in love with this medium and so, you know, I will always have bias towards him. And to have Damien Chazelle and Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie work on a film about films, like, I'm done. You know, I, no, nothing left needs to be said. Should we actually get to see some of these films? 2021 may well be one of the great, great, great years in, in cinema history because we've got, you know, once again, twice the amount of films. And so I, I think we have a lot to be excited about and we have a lot to be looking forward to and we have to, a lot to be optimistic about. So anyway, guys, that was my list uh, of the most anticipated films of 2021. Thank you very, very much, uh, as always, for watching. Stay tuned for more videos to come. Thank you and have a happy new year.